Hi guys, my name's Andy and this is the Opinionated Reefer. Today I'm going to answer the question, are saltwater aquariums worth it? Should you get one of these? A reef tank, saltwater aquarium, whatever you want to call it, should you get one? And the answer is, absolutely no way should you get one of these. You might think it's a bit weird me standing here saying that reef tanks aren't worth it when I'm standing here in front of a reef tank, but if some, somebody was to ask me should they get a reef tank, I would say for the vast majority of people, probably not. Don't get one. Get a dog, get a cat, don't get one of these things. Reef keeping, it isn't easy, right? Just have to look at the second hand market. Go on Gumtree, go on Ultimate Reef. Go on Facebook ads, anything, you'll see there's a massive amount of uh, saltwater aquarium equipment for sale and the reason for that is most people, they see a fancy tank, they think I want that, so they do a bit of research, they jump in, but they don't do enough research, they spend thousands and thousands of pounds on equipment, it goes badly, they quit the hobby within six months to a year. Simple as that. I, mean, I used to always wonder uh, how how can a time like this possibly possibly cost say five, ten k, ten thousand pounds? But now that I'm, I mean I'm in the hobby, I can easily see where that is. The cost of owning one of these aquariums can be astronomical. I mean everything you see here, I basically bought used everything. Um, the tank, that was from a tank shutdown, uh, I got the NP40s, the return pump, uh, the heater, a lot of other stuff with it. Um, I mean, even the lights, I mean, this is T5, so this is a lot cheaper than, say, a common LED unit. Again, I bought it used, um, bought the Orphix brand new, but, uh, I mean, the cost is just mind blowing. Um, most of the frags I, I buy from uh, fellow reefers to, to save money, I swap other reefers. So, I mean, there is ways of mitigating the cost somewhat, but uh, there's just no way around it. This is an incredibly expensive hobby, and you have to be prepared for that. Now, if you're like me, you're probably not going to listen to this video, you're going to go ahead and do it anyway. I mean, that's fine. Um, the, the, the reason I'm making this video is just to let you know what you're getting into before you start. Maybe you'll rethink, maybe you'll save yourself a lot of time and money. So, what are some of the, the good points about owning a reef tank? Well, they're stunning. I mean, Corals for us, it's, it's fish are stunning, much more uh, colourful and attractive looking than your, your freshwater fish. I mean, it's uh, I mean, the whole thing's like a living work of art. Anybody that comes into your house is usually mesmerised by it. I think it's amazing. Uh, another good point is obviously you're learning a lot about uh, reefs in the wild and biology. Uh, some of these corals, the symbiotic relationships uh, exist in the reef, uh, learning a lot about water chemistry and um, stuff like that. But another good point about the hobby is if you're into uh, tinkering with, with things, and technical, technical side of the hobby, you can certainly uh, tinker away and add new gadgets to your heart's content. So, I mean, I like this hobby, I'm going to keep it going. Um, so yeah. Now one of the first things that makes keeping a, a reef tank difficult is uh, maintenance. You know, you've got to clean the glass, you've got to clean the pumps, you've got to clean the other various bits of equipment. Um, you have to perform regular uh, water tests. Uh, basically you need to keep certain water parameters uh, in check. What are these parameters? Well, first of all, you've got salinity, that's the most important. You've then got alkalinity, calcium, 
magnesium, nitrate, phosphates. Now, I kid you not, you need to keep on top of all those things. Obviously, some of them a bit more important than others, like your salinity or your alkalinity, especially if we're uh, keeping corals as concerned. Um, but that's, that's only the tip of the iceberg. And don't get me wrong, you can uh, go down the automation route, get yourself uh, an aquarium controller like an Apex or a GF, GHL Proflux, but still, unexpected things are going to catch you out. What happens if uh, your return pump fails or some other bit of equipment fails for whatever reason? Does no matter, could be anything. You better be prepared to like just drop everything and come and deal with it because there's a high chance if you don't, everything's going to die. And I mean, it, it can happen just just like that. I mean, it's pretty hard to describe just how much risk is involved in this. I mean, we spend so much time and money uh, in keeping basically these life forms alive inside a glass box that. Uh, if anything majorly goes wrong and you're not around to deal with it, they're dead. That's it. Simple as that. It's better hope you don't have any kind of power cut or lose power for a prolonged period of time because if you don't have a generator or a battery backup, that's it. Game over. Another major con to owning a reef tank is the never-ending battles that you're going to have to face. It doesn't matter how experienced a reefer you are. You're always going to be battling something, whether it be green hair, algae, cyanobacteria, uh, dinoflagellates, acropora eating flatworms. It doesn't matter, you're always going to be facing some kind of challenge in this hobby. Usually the first thing that you reefers have to deal with is uh, algae. There's various types of algae in the hobby, green hair algae, bubble algae, um, Ryopsis, a list as long as your arm, but usually that's the first issue that you're going to have to face and the general advice is lower your nutrients. So what that basically means is lower your nitrates and your phosphate levels in the water. So you'll go online, you'll do your research, you'll figure out how to use various different tools and supplements to lower your nutrients, you'll strip the, the nutrients out of the water. What eventually happens is this starves the algae out, but in doing that you're also starving your corals. Um, what usually happens is once you've uh, managed to starve the algae out, you then, you then cause some other kind of imbalance in the tank, so then you suddenly realise, well, what's this uh, red slime that's suddenly appearing everywhere? And you, you find out actually you've just got rid of your uh, green hair algae, now you, you, you've got to deal with cyano, cyanobacteria, and you're like, what? So you go back online, you figure out this is actually quite an easy one to deal with. Um, usually you can beat that by simply dosing something called ChemiClean, a red slime remover. That kind of removes it overnight, basically. So you, you've got your cyan, you, you beat your hair algae, you, you defeated cyano, you think, eh, well, I'm not a winner here now, my nutrients are nice and low, um, and all of a sudden you see this like brown, stringy, slimy stuff starting to appear on your corals and your rocks, and you're going to choke out corals, and you're like, what's this? It's no, is it, it's a bit like cyano, it's a bit like algae, but neither lowering your nutrients further or dosing chemically seems to have any effect. You go back and you find that you've got the dinos are dinoflagellates, and this is a far worse problem than either cyanobacteria or hair algae. And it's actually caused by having too low nutrients in the tank. So you go back online, people are starting to tell you that the way you beat dinos is by doing the opposite of what you did to beat your algae problem. So they're telling you to increase the nutrients in your tank. So you do that and eventually the dino starts to maybe disappear. But at the same time, your green hair algae is coming back. And you're like, I mean, I mean what's going on? This, this is a point where a lot of people actually just throw the towel on because it's very, very difficult to get this sort of balance where you've got enough nutrition in the water column 
Well, there's my little top off going off. Uh, you've got enough uh, nutrients in the water column to uh, meet your corals' needs, but not to encourage algae growth. I mean, that is a very, very difficult balance to achieve. And to be quite honest, it's a, it's a battle that's it's going to carry on all the way through your entire reefing career as a reefing hobbyist. So just another con you're going to have to get used to, I'm afraid. One of the most common uh, pests in the hobby is a pest, an enemy called Aptasia, that uh, once it gets in your tank, it's virtually impossible to get rid of. Basically, it likes the same conditions as most of your corals, so it spreads all, all, all through the tank and grows in your rocks and in between corals and can sting your corals, choke out various corals. Basically, the more you feed the tank, the more the numbers can explode and get out of control. And if you, say, try and interfere with the aptasia in any way or kill it or physically remove it, it just causes it to release uh, spores or gametes into the water column, which spreads it even further. Another pretty uh, common pest is uh, vermited snails. I think that's how you say it. These are like little uh, mollusks that can grow all over your rocks and they don't move, but they sort of build a little calcinous tube that extends out uh, from their, their, their shell or their, their base. And uh, whenever you're putting food in the water, they can extend a, a long sort of slime trail into the water, it waves in the water and it picks up food particles. Now, these are pretty harmless and get, they can be unsightly, but certain corals that can irritate causing the corals to close up and maybe eventually die but just another like pest there's no way to rid this you're tank of that a vermited snails without like killing all your corals at the same time and um, you've also got various other types of pests like flatworms uh, you got euphila eating flatworms acropora eating flatworms what i've got in this tank which is one of the worst pests you can possibly get um, We'll get into that in another video. Uh, you've got just ordinary flatworms that can become a nuisance in the tank, don't harm anything, but they get become vast numbers of them. And you've got, you've got red bugs, black bugs. And basically, there's a list of pests, parasites, as long as you're arming this hobby. And the way you deal with that usually is by using a quarantine tank. So Real experienced uh, reef keepers tend to have a quarantine tank for their corals and a separate quarantine tank for their fish. I mean, I'm no joking, to, to do this properly, you really need two quarantine tanks to run one reef tank. Uh -huh. I mean, most people probably won't take it that far, but you really, really want it to be super, super uh, secure, that's what you do. The fish diseases and parasites are actually very common in this hobby. And tank wipeouts happen a lot more often than you think. When you ask any experienced reef keeper and guaranteed they've had somebody, they know somebody or they've had it themselves where they've put a fish in the tank without quarantining it and uh, bang. In a couple of days, all their fish are infected with either ick or velvet. And if it, in the case of velvet, basically all your fish are dead within a couple of days. Um, so, unfortunately, this is a lesson that most reef keepers have to learn the hard way. If you put an unquarantined fish into your display tank, you're failing at the first hurdle. You're playing Russian roulette with the lives of every single fish in that tank. And there's no reef safe way to cure these diseases. Now you'll see people talking absolute garbage, like saying things like, oh, feed your uh, fish um, uh, uh, garlic. That will not cure ick or velvet. Um, or you get some sort of snake oil product that claims to be a reef safe uh, parasite medication. It's no possible, guys. The only way to cure your tank of ick or velvet would be to catch every fish in the tank, put them in a separate quarantine tank, treat that 
trying with a copper based medication. Uh, there is various other medications, but the most common one you're going to be able to buy over the counter is some sort of copper based medication. You've got to treat the fish in that tank for 30 days, then transfer them to another clean tank for another 30 days observation, while at the same time leaving your reef tank completely clear of fish so that the parasite will actually die out in the water column because if it's not got a host, it uh, can't replicate. I mean, some people say it can take up to 12 weeks, so can you imagine leaving a tank like this completely empty fish for 12 weeks? But according to your fish guys, there is just no other option. Now, I can understand you've got a small tank, say less than two feet, maybe a nano tank with a couple of small fish, a few small corals, it isn't worth it. But uh, a big tank with tangs and, and various other expensive fish, don't play Russian roulette, you will lose. You need to quarantine your fish. It's as simple as that. Now, one of the hardest challenges in keeping a reef tank is when you get into the hobby far enough that you're actually keeping SPS corals like, like what I'm doing here, the various sort of Acropora and Montipora type corals. Now, in order to keep these types of corals alive, you need to keep your tank stable. And what that means is you can't have any major fluctuations in either salinity or alkalinity. You can have some swings in maybe temperature, calcium, magnesium, but to keep them alive, you basically need to keep your salinity perfectly stable. If you keep your tank at 35 parts per thousand, it needs to stay at 35 parts per thousand. If you keep your alkalinity at 8 dKH, it really needs to stay at 8 dKH. If you have a major swing in alkalinity levels, um, say more than 1 dKH a day, they're going to start losing your, your corals, especially the more sensitive ones like uh, Acropora. Uh, it's no easy to, to, to sort of balance uh, your alkalinity levels. Basically, you've got to keep dosing whatever the corals are uh, using up. So all these corals, basically, as they grow, they're sucking their calcium and alkalinity out of the water. You've got to keep replacing that via dosing alkalinity calcium supplements and trace element supplements back into the water column at the same rate as the corals are uh, taking it up. Now, it's a skill that takes quite, it's got quite a learning curve to it. Uh, and it's not only that, once you've, you think, once you've got your dosing pumps or your calcium reactor or whatever method of uh, maintaining your uh, parameters dialed in to the level you want to keep it at, um, it's a moving target because as the corals grow, they uh, start to use up more of uh, these elements you've got to keep putting more in. But then at the same time, if there's, say, a temperature drop, or something else affect the tank, they can suddenly stop sucking in so much uh, alkalinity and calcium and you've got to be able to readjust your dosing uh, amounts to, to cope with this. So it's like, it's like a moving target that you're constantly trying to uh, follow. Um, it's no easy guys. Uh, uh, if it gets out of whack, if anything goes majorly wrong, bang, all them are dead. So just another uh, major headache in the world of keeping a reef tank. And to be fair, there is various different levels of uh, reef keeping and saltwater aquariums, some being a lot easier than others. So for example, you could start off with just a fish only with live rock tank, I mean, can it get any easier than that? That's basically very similar to freshwater fish keeping. So you just got your fish, you don't have to worry about any of these parameters or anything like that. Um, you've also got, you could maybe have a fish only with live rock and some soft corals. Again, soft corals, they're much, much easier to maintain than uh, your stony corals. So you don't need to worry about dozing, you don't need to worry about your nutrients getting quite so uh, out of control. Um, the, the corals aren't going to die. I mean, some of these soft corals are virtually indestructible. Um, 
The next level above that is say your, your mixed reefs where you've got some soft corals, some LPS corals, some SPS corals, usually the easier SPS corals. Um, uh, they can be fairly challenging because it's impossible to keep every type of coral happy in a single tank, basically due to different lighting and flow requirements. But that's usually, uh, yeah, a mixed reef is actually the most common type of reef tank. You then, at the top of the tree, which I've went for, unfortunately for me, is the SPS dominant tank, which is basically wall to wall stony corals. I've got a few euphelia in here, um, but these take the most maintenance, the most you need the most like strong lighting requirements, most strong floor requirements. Basically, you need the, all the top notch equipment to keep them alive. Oh, you're still here. You've not left after me ranting and raving about how difficult it was to keep a reef tank. Well, if that's the case, then maybe you are the sort of person that I would recommend gets a reef tank. Now, I know this video has came off as pretty negative but I really enjoy this hobby and I'm going to stay at the hobby and I do think for the right type of person that the time, effort and money involved in this hobby is actually worth it. If you're a really patient person, pretty technical, then, then you might get a lot out of this like I do. I just uh, wanted to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into before you uh, jump in the deep end. So hopefully this has uh, gave you a sort of balanced uh, view of what it's actually like to own one of these reef tanks and you can make up your own mind whether you want to get yourself one or not. So if in any doubt, get yourself a dog or a cat and save yourself a whole bunch of time and money. Peace, I'm out.